All right, let's go ahead and start our next units on organic chemistry, also known as OCHEM. And so we're going to focus on three main things uh, for this particular part of our study of organic chemistry. Uh, we're going to learn how to name organic compounds, so nomenclature. Uh, we're going to learn how to draw structural formulas for hydrocarbons and other organic compounds. And then we're going to learn about the different types of isomers. So this will be a good introduction to what we'll do later, which is uh, learn about some of the more simple and basic uh, reactions involving organic compounds. So our focus will be on uh, hydrocarbons. So organic compounds are compounds that contain carbon and hydrogen primarily. There's other elements as well, but these are compounds that have lots of carbon, lots of hydrogen. And then as we'll see later, uh, some of them have oxygen, nitrogen, uh, sulfur, and some other things. So let's take a look at uh, why organic compounds, organic molecules are so prevalent. So um, there are many, 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 many more organic compounds than there are ionic or molecular compounds or what we call inorganic compounds. So what we've studied so far is called inorganic chemistry, and then now we're on to organic chemistry. So uh, here are several things about carbon that makes it unique and that allows for it to form many, many, many different compounds. Uh, first of all, carbon forms only covalent bonds. Um, it has uh, four valence electrons, which will allow it to make four covalent bonds. And we'll see that um, we'll look at it more later, but I'll introduce it now. Carbon can form four single covalent bonds, or one double and two single bonds, or one triple and one single bond, or even in fact, as is the case of carbon dioxide, uh, two double bonds. So it has a, a great variety in terms of the types of covalent bonds that it can form. Uh, always forming, though, a total of four covalent bonds. Now let's take a look at the other uh, atoms that are bonded to carbon in these organic molecules. Um, oxygen can form two bonds. So remember that uh, oxygen has six valence electrons. So it can achieve stability by having eight total valence electrons, and it can do that by forming two bonds. And again, that could be two single bonds, as we'll see in some situations. Uh, more often, though, um, or maybe not more often, but just as often, we'll see that carbon can form one double bond. So two single bonds or one double bond. Uh, hydrogen has one valence electron, therefore it can form only one covalent bond. Nitrogen has five valence electrons. Uh, remember, though, it cannot exceed the octet rule. It has no d orbitals. Uh, that would be needed to have an expanded octet and to be anything beyond sp3 hybridized. Uh, so nitrogen, though it can form four covalent bonds, uh, typically will form three covalent bonds. And then I added this in there, the halogens, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, uh, they all have seven valence electrons, and because of that, they will form just one covalent bond. So again, something else that contributes to the large number of compounds containing carbon uh, has to do with the strength and stability of both the carbon-carbon bonds and carbon-hydrogen bonds. Both are extremely strong, and they're very stable. And we'll see uh, later on uh, what types of bonds allow uh, organic molecules to be reactive. Uh, something else that's unique to carbon is that it has the ability to bond to other carbon atoms to form long chains. And so uh, this allows for many different compounds uh, that differ by only one carbon and two hydrogen atoms. So if you think about, say, uh, methane, methane has a chemical formula of CH4. Uh, ethane has two carbons. Its chemical formula is C2H6. Those compounds differ by just one carbon and two hydrogen atoms. Uh, if we keep going, we have compounds like propane, which has three carbons. Chemical formula C3H8. Uh, that has one more carbon and two more hydrogens than ethane, and we can keep going like that. Uh, these compounds that differ just by uh, number of carbons and hydrogens uh, are known to be part of a homologous series. And so we'll be looking at 
um, reactions involving substances in a homologous series. We'll also be looking at the um, properties, physical properties of members of a homologous series. So it says here that uh, these substances have similar properties with a gradation of physical properties, meaning there's uh, a trend that we see. Um, if we think about compounds like methane and ethane and propane and butane, uh, these are all nonpolar molecules. And so their attractive forces consist of just dispersion forces. And the strength of dispersion forces varies with uh, size or length of the carbon chain um, or size of the um, electron cloud. And so we see uh, similar properties, but there is definitely uh, differences depending on the length of the chain or the size of the electron cloud. If you take a look on page uh, four, or sorry, 974, we see some of the uh, substances I mentioned, along with many, many, many others, starting with a one carbon hydrocarbon all the way down to a 20 carbon hydrocarbon. And so something uh, that you can do uh, initially is look at the names, because we'll be naming these compounds uh, in a little bit. So be familiar with the names, at least uh, one through 10 carbons. Past 10, we're not too concerned about, but you can see some of their names. Uh, look at the boiling points and melting points. So methane, starting at the top, is the most simple of the hydrocarbons, uh, has very weak dispersion forces and therefore has the lowest boiling point of all of those substances. Uh, as we see the number of carbons in the chain increase, the size of those molecules increase, so does the boiling point. So ethane has a higher boiling point than methane, propane has a higher boiling point than ethane, butane higher than propane, and so on. And we see that trend uh, for the most part continue except for our uh, C20H42, so don't worry about that. Uh, we see a general, uh, similar general trend in uh, melting point as well. So as dispersion forces increase, so does the uh, boiling point and melting point. Uh, something else to keep in mind is the state of matter. Um, state of matter at room temperature. So again, that has to do with the strength of the attractive forces. So once you get past uh, five car, or sorry, past four carbons, then uh, we see that um, well, we can imply or we can assume that the dispersion forces are strong enough to hold the particles together either in a liquid or in a solid. So four carbons or less, dispersion forces are really weak, and you end up with a gas at room temperature. All right, so we'll be talking a lot about uh, the different types of hydrocarbons. There's lots of different ways of classifying them. Um, we'll continue here with uh, looking at the difference between alkanes, alkenes, and alkynes. So uh, first of all, alkanes are compounds that have all carbon-carbon single bonds. Uh, these are also known as saturated hydrocarbons. And so the general formula for an alkane is CnH2n plus 2. So methane is an alkane. So uh, N is 1. And so 2 times 1 is 2 plus 2. We have 4 hydrogen CH4. Ethane, also an alkane. C2H6, so N is 2. 2 times 2 is 4 plus 2, that's 6. That's how we get the 6 hydrogen. So anytime you see a chemical formula where you have um, 2 plus 2, sorry, let me see if I can say this correctly, 2 plus 2 times the number of hydrogens as carbons, then that uh, molecule is saturated and it is an alkane. So notice I've been uh, focusing on this suffix here and with my names, alkane, methane, ethane, propane, butane, pentane, hexane, and so on. So if you see that ane suffix, uh, we know that it is a saturated hyd hydrocarbon, all the carbon-carbon bonds. It's not all of the bonds, just the carbon-carbon bonds are single bonds. Alkenes. Uh, these have at least one carbon-carbon double bond. And again, it doesn't mean carbon-oxygen or carbon-something else. Carbon-carbon double bond. Uh, general formula for alkene, CnH2n. Uh, so ethene, 
for example, has a chemical formula of C2H4, uh, twice as many hydrogens as carbon. Um, propene is another uh, alkene. Uh, butene, pentene, so notice that with the alkenes we have this ene suffix. That ene suffix tells us there is a double bond somewhere in the chain of carbons. And then lastly, we have the alkynes. Uh, these are compounds that have all kinds of bonds. We're talking about carbon-carbon triple bonds. And again, we're looking at this suffix here. So ethyne C2H2. So uh, again, it's not equal number of hydrogens as carbon. It looks that way in, in ethyne C2H2, uh, also known as acetylene, by the way. Uh, but it's CnH2n minus 2. So 2 carbons, 2 times 2 is 4 minus 2, 2 hydrogens in ethyne. So we have ethyne, propyne, butyne, pentyne, and so on. All right, there's a couple different ways of representing uh, hydrocarbons. Uh, we can use either structural formulas or condensed structural formulas. So with a structural formula, it's kind of like a Lewis structure. It shows every atom including each hydrogen and every bond in that molecule. Uh, all the bond angles uh, for atoms with no lone pairs at least are at a maximum. So let's take a look at some examples. So just like in a Lewis structure, these lines represent covalent bonds. So it looks like we have six carbons in this chain. This is a saturated hydrocarbon. So we're going to have 14 hydrogens. So this is a uh, structural formula. Let me show you another one. So you can see the uh, bond angles here. It looks like 90 degrees. Uh, we know this; it's not 90 degrees. This is just two-dimensional. So those uh, tetrahedral arrangements, those are 109.5. Uh, this carbon here that has the double bond O and the OH, um, that is a trigonal planar geometry around that. We'll talk more about uh, geometry around the carbons uh, a little bit later on. So that's a structural formula. Uh, the other way of representing a hydrocarbon is with something called a condensed structural formula. Uh, condensed structural formula show all of the atoms in the molecule, but they do not show any of the bonds. So let's look at our first example. It was C6H14. And the condensed structural formula for it looks like this. Now, can you see why it's written this way? So if we look back at our structural formula, we have CH3 here on the left end, and then we have all these CH2s, one, two, three, four, all the carbons in the middle of the chain, if you will, and there's four of them. So we can just group those all together, CH2, four, and then we have another CH3 on the end. So we end up with uh, this as our condensed structural formula. Uh, what do you think the condensed structural formula looks like for the second one that I drew? Well, we find, kind of follow the same approach. So we have a CH3 on the end. We have a CH2 next to that. And then we have this COOH. Now, we don't want to write CO2H. Uh, notice that in our structural formula, one of the oxygens is double bonded to carbon, and one of them is single bonded to carbon. So a uh, typical way we write a condensed structural formula for that kind of molecule, which is known as a carboxylic acid, is with this COOH uh, part of it there. All right, some more classification of hydrocarbons. A couple categories. We have the aliphatic hydrocarbons. These consist of the straight-chained, uh, the branch-chained, and cyclic compounds. Uh, these, of course, include the alkanes, the alkenes, and the alkynes. Uh, the other category of hydrocarbons are known as the aromatic hydrocarbons. Uh, the aromatic hydrocarbons contain stable rings of carbon atoms. They're all based on this compound called benzene. 
Benzene is a six carbon ring with alternating double bonds. Uh, extremely stable structure, which means not very reactive, as we'll see uh, later on. Benzene by itself, not reactive, but uh, their derivatives of benzene uh, can be reactive. Uh, this is also important for later on. The alkanes by themselves are fairly unreactive, again, due to the strength and stability of the bonds. Uh, also, lack of polarity and the absence of low energy unfilled orbitals. So this implies then that if you have a polar molecule or a molecule that has uh, lone pairs of electrons, um, that makes it fairly reactive. And so we'll be looking at those uh, reactions involving organic compounds later. All right, this part is especially important for when we're drawing structural formulas. We want to represent the uh, substance as best we can, even though it's two-dimensionally. So if you have a tetrahedral arrangement, or sorry, let's back up. If you have four bonds around a carbon, uh, that will have a tetrahedral arrangement, bond angles of 109.5. Uh, if you have a carbon that has one double bond and two single bonds, as we saw in the uh, example earlier, uh, we have a trigonal planar geometry around that carbon. Uh, if a carbon has one triple bond and one single bond, uh, we'll have a linear geometry. And then if there's two double bonds, uh, that's also linear. So let me, uh, maybe you should draw these out. So four bonds, tetrahedral arrangements. If you have a, a double bond and two single bonds, that's a trigonal planar geometry. If you have a triple bond and one single bond, that's a linear arrangement around the carbon. And then, like I said, in carbon dioxide, you have two double bonds. That's also a linear arrangement around the carbon. All right, so let's go through the rules or steps, if you will, to name a hydrocarbon. Uh, first of all, the substance bears the longest sorry, bears the name of the longest continuous chain of carbon atoms. This is known as the parent chain. So we always want to find the longest continuous sequence of carbons, and we're going to start off with that part of the name. So make sure you know uh, the roots we use for a different number of carbons. One carbon, the root is meth, two carbons, eth, three prope, four but, five pent, six hex, seven hept, not sept, 8 oct, 9 non, 10 dec. These are all in that table that I showed you earlier as well. And as I said before, saturation or unsaturation is shown in the last part of the name, uh, that being a suffix. So we have the ane suffix for saturated hydrocarbons, uh, ene or ein suffix for unsaturated hydrocarbons. Next, we're going to number consecutively the carbon atoms of the parent chain. Uh, these numbers are used to indicate where any branches may be on the parent chain or functional groups like on your handouts that I gave you or any uh, double or triple bonds as well. We're going to locate those uh, with numbers. So number the carbons of the parent chain. Uh, by the way, these numbers are chosen. So the lowest numbers possible are given to the side chains. So anywhere where we have branches or functional groups. Uh, nevertheless. Uh, if you have a double or triple bond, a multiple bond, that takes priority as far as numbering is concerned, regardless of where any branches or functional groups are on the parent chain. So a double or triple bond has to be given the lowest number possible when you are numbering. Next, determine the name or names of the groups attached to the parent chain. Again, these are on the handouts. You have things like amino groups and nitros and the halides, chloro and fluoro and bromo. Uh, you have alkyl groups. Uh, alkyl groups um, are carbon containing groups. And we can see here that we use the ol, yl suffix for our alkyl groups like methyl and ethyl and propyl. Uh, the numbers that are assigned uh, previously are used to prefix the names of the groups attached to the chain. So we could have something like uh, 2-methylbutane. So 
Uh, the two comes before the name of the branch. We have a methyl group. That's a one carbon branch. It's going to go on carbon number two of the parent chain. And in fact, in that case, two methyl butane, we actually don't even need that two. So we'll see sometimes you need numbers and sometimes you don't need numbers. So it just depends. And we'll do as many examples uh, as we can. Uh, sometimes and oftentimes you have the same uh, branch or functional group attached to the parent chain, multiple of the same branch or functional group. And if that's the case, we need to use prefixes to tell us how many uh, there are. So let's say you had two chloros attached to the parent chain, either on the same carbon or different carbons, doesn't matter. We're going to use a prefix di to represent the fact that there are two chlorines on the parent chain, dichloro, or dimethyl, or dibromo, or dinitro. Um, likewise, if you have three of these same functional groups, we use a prefix tri, trimethyl, triethyl, triiodo. Uh, four is tetra, so not quad. Sometimes students want to say quad, tetra, tetramethyl, tetraiodo, tetrachloro. Uh, five would be penta, and it goes, uh, keeps going like that. Next, name the attached groups first in alphabetical order. That means chloro comes before methyl. That means bromo comes before iodo. That means amino comes before nitro. So be sure to memorize the functional groups on the handout I gave you. There's also a table in your book on page 1011. Memorize those as soon as you can because you will not be able to use that handout or that table in your book on your test. All right, let's do some examples. Uh, first, let's name compounds that do not have oxygen in them. So notice on your handout we have some non-oxygen containing functional groups. Those are in the top half of the handouts. And then you have oxygen containing functional groups in the bottom half. So I'm going to draw structural formulas. Now I'm going to draw kind of a hybrid structural condensed uh, formula. Um, I'm not going to put all of the H's and so uh, just to save us some time. So let's go ahead and draw this out. So where a bond goes seemingly to nothing, like this bond and this bond and this bond, those are bonds uh, to hydrogen. I'm just not going to write uh, the H's. So let's go ahead and name this compound. All right, our first step is to name the parent chain, even though that's not going to go in the first part of the name, but we still need to identify the parent chain. So we want to look for the longest continuous sequence of carbons, and it looks like we have four carbons. And so what we're going to do is we're going to start with the roots for a four-carbon chain, which is but, not but, but. Let's next take a look at the bonds between the carbon atoms. Notice that all the uh, carbons are bonded to each other with single bonds. So this is a saturated hydrocarbon. So the suffix we use for a saturated hydrocarbon is butane. Uh, next, we want to identify the branches or functional groups, the things attached to the parent chain. We have two chlorines, and we name those as chloro. Uh, two of the same, so uh, we got a combination of things going on here. So we're going to use the prefix di to indicate that we have two chlorines on the parent chain. So this is going to be called dichlorobutane. Now we can't just call it dichlorobutane because where are the chlorines? Are they both on carbon number one? Is one on carbon number one, one on carbon two? One on one, one on three, one on one, one on four. Where are they? We have to say, and we have to specify in the name, where they are on the parent chain. So next question is, where is carbon number one? Left carbon, this one here, or right carbon, this one here? Well, in this case, it doesn't matter. Sometimes it does matter where you make carbon number one. Uh, remember, we want the lowest total numbers for our uh, branches or functional groups possible. So in this case, it doesn't matter. Um, I'm going to number from left to right. So this is carbon number one, two, three, four. Uh, we see that we have uh, two chlorines, one on carbon number two and one on carbon number three. Uh, to separate numbers from numbers, we're going to use a comma. 
to separate numbers from letters, we're going to use a dash. So this is written like that. And we name it 2,3-dichlorobutane. All right, let's try. I'm going to add to this. Let me erase these numbers here. Uh, let's add to this one. Let's go. Let's put another chlorine there. So first of all, we have trichlorobutane this time. Where is carbon number one, on the left or on the right? Well, if we number from left to right, we have two, one chlorine on carbon number two and two chlorines on carbon number three. Now, we can't just put two, three. We need a number for each branch or functional group. So this would be two, three, three, which gives us a total of eight as far as where our branches are functional groups. If we number the other way around, so let's number from right to left, one, two, three, four, we have one carbon, sorry, let's go low to high, two carbons on carbon number, sorry, two chlorines on carbon number two, and one on number three. And that would give us a total of seven. So which is better, seven or eight? Uh, that would be seven, lowest number possible. And so we're going to go number from right to left. We have two, two, three, trichlorobutane. All right, let's take a look at another example. Draw small. We'll try to fit in as many as we can here. All right, so that carbon is not bonded to that nitrogen. Just this carbon is bonded to nitrogen. All right, again, let's start off with the parent chain. One, two, three, four, five carbons. So root for a five-carbon chain is pence. Next, saturated or unsaturated. It looks like all of the bonds between carbons are single bonds. So this is a saturated hydrocarbon. This is pentane. Next, let's see what we have here. We have this uh, carbon-containing branch. We got this NH2 group, and we have a bromine. So let's, uh, let's first name these, because remember, we want to put them in alphabetical order, not numeric order. It doesn't matter where they are on the parent chain. It's got to go alphabetical order. So this is not bromine, but bromo. Uh, NH2, find that on your handout. What do we call an NH2 group? That's an amino group. And then we have a one carbon branch. Root for one carbon, meth, carbon containing branch, alkyl group, F, or sorry, pol. This is called methyl. So which goes first in the name? It's going to go amino, followed by bromo, followed by methyl. So let's see if I can squeeze this in here. Amino. Actually, no, we don't want to do that just yet because each of these uh, will be prefixed with a number. So how do we want a number, from right to left or left to right? Well, it looks like there's more things closer to the right side than there are the left side. So I'm going to number, I'm going to make this number one and make this number five. So we're going to number from uh, right to left. All right, so where is the amino group? The amino group is on carbon number two. So we're going to write two amino. Followed by bromo, where is it? It's on number two as well. So two amino, two bromo, and then where's our methyl group? It's on number three. And I just was able to squeeze that in. So that's all written together, there's no spaces there. So this is called two amino, two bromo, three methyl pentane, all one word. All right, let's try another. Here's one that I mentioned earlier. All right, first step is to determine the parent chain, longest continuous sequence of carbons. 
Um, that could be here. Don't just look at the straight part, though. Sometimes um, we have to kind of zigzag our way around. So that's four carbons. Oops. We also get four carbons if we go this way. So it doesn't really matter. If you have a choice and it doesn't matter, then I would just go with the, uh, the straight part. So here's our parent chain. And then we have a carbon branch. So four carbon parent chain. Root is butte. This is a saturated hydrocarbon, so butane. Uh, we have a methyl group here, so just one methyl. And then how are we going to number this, from left to right or right to left? Looks like the uh, methyl is closer to the left side, so we're going to number this one, two, three, four. And where is the methyl group? It's on carbon number two, except I don't think we need that number. So here's the deal. If the branch or functional group can only go on one carbon, then we don't need a number because there's no choice. There's no options. Well, some of you might be thinking, well, can't the methyl group go on carbon number three? Well, that wouldn't be carbon number three then. We would number from right to left in that case, and it would still be on number two. Well, can't the methyl group go on carbon number one? Now, if it goes on carbon number one, no longer is this butane, this is pentane. So you can never have a, an alkyl group on the ends of the chain. That's going to lengthen the chain. It's going to extend it and make it something that it's not. It's not butane in that case. So because the methyl group can only go on carbon number two, technically we don't need a number. So I've seen this before though, both ways, 2-methylbutane or just methylbutane. So if you see this name, methylbutane, you're like, oh wow, where's the methyl group? Well, uh, there's no number because, not that I forgot to write it, but rather because that methyl group can only go on one carbon. All right, next up, let's try this. Let me give you a condensed structural formula and you name this compound. Uh, here's my suggestion. My suggestion is to take the condensed structural formula and draw a regular structural formula. So we got some weird things going on here. We got CH3, so that's our carbon on the end. That's fine. And then we have CH. Shouldn't that be a CH2? Well, not really. So you know what? This time I'm going to draw in the H's just so you can see. So this is CH. But then next to it, we have CH3. That's not here because we have more carbons in the chain. So that CH3 here is a methyl group. So notice this carbon is just CH. Next, we have CH2. I guess I should put my H's on my methyl group as well. And then CH3. Look, similar, look familiar? This is, once again, methyl butane so be careful sometimes we have double bonds uh, if it's you know if it's not a ch2 in the middle then it's not uh, single bonded to the carbons on either side of it so be careful with that let's take a look at another one that's ch3 So go ahead and pause the video, draw this out, and name it. All right, so this time we have two methyl groups. Notice we have these two CH3s connected to the C with no H's on it because it's connected to or bonded to two carbons on either side. And so this is dimethylbutane. Do we need numbers? Well... One methyl could be on number two, and one can be on number three. In this case, they're both on number two, so we do need numbers. 2,2-dimethylbutane. Two, two, now let's go ahead and do one more. Go ahead and pause the video, draw this out, and name it. Be careful.
All right, be careful. Make sure each of your carbons has four total bonds. We have a double bond this time. We have CH, we have CH. And because of that, that must mean there's a double bond between the two. So how are we going to number? Left to right or right to left? One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Well, how do we locate a double or triple bond? The number tells us which carbon the double or triple bond comes after. So if we number from left to right, the double bond comes after carbon number two. If we number from right to left, the double bond comes after, because we're going this way, carbon number three. So which is better? I think two is better than three. So again, since this double bond can go in more than one place on the parent chain, it can go after number one, it can go after number two, can't go after number three, because that would be mean we're numbering from the opposite direction still after number two. So it can either go after number one or after number two, so we need a number. So there's two ways of doing this. Uh, parent chain is one, two, three, four, five. This is pentene. And so we can say two pentene. So that two is for our double bond. Or you can put the number before the suffix, pent two in. Either way is fine. All right, I think we're going to stop there now, and we'll do examples of compounds containing oxygen in them next time. All right, thanks for watching.